A walkout at the meeting between the port and the stevedores will show you how the minister had to run down Mose to get him to come back to the table. And Central American bosses piled up at the western border. They say they are Christians. The government fares, it's a caravan of asylum seekers. Also, the Ministry of Education bows to the union and agrees to hold off on implementing the new hardship list plus 10 years after he burnt his sister's home. A family makes a plea to get their mentally ill brother out of jail. Also, Belize City woman survives an arson attempt. She tells us why she's happy to be alive. We've got details of these and other stories in our newscast for tonight, Thursday, October 18, 2018. Good evening. With your news, I'm in your crime.
Tomorrow will make it 21 days since the Christian Workers Union gave three weeks strike notice to Port and the stevedores had reached an impasse in negotiations over the issue of the hours of work. The stevedores want to work shifts exceeding 15 hours. The port says it's against the law. The labor minister interceded, broke the impasse and got them to return to the negotiating table. They did so yesterday and both sides emerged with positive views on the progress they made. It was looking like the dispute was on the way to being resolved without a need for strike. That's until the port and the CWU return today to discuss the union's counter-proposal on a fix for the hours of work. 7 News was at the Labor Office this afternoon's follow-up meeting and we were surprised to find out that the union's negotiating team left the meeting early. That's because the port wanted them to stop the countdown on the 21 days notice for the strike, which ends tomorrow. The union was still not prepared to do that, and that almost caused a complete breakdown in talks. Daniel Ortiz picks up the story at that moment, and here's his report. Six minutes after the meeting was scheduled to start, we saw the CWU president and the Stevie Doors' negotiating team exiting the labor office. They left early, citing a frustration with the latest position from the port's CEO. We decided to leave the room because the other side, the Portable is Limited, they are challenging the minister to get us to rescind our strike before he negotiates. The minister opened the meeting by stating that she is going to extend our strike uh, action 10 more days, which she has the power to do. He is not comfortable with that. He is challenging the minister's position. That's, not, that's between him and the minister. We are around the table. Our time is as precious as the port's time. We asked, are we going to negotiate, to which there was no answer. We have decided to leave the room. That's our position right now. Just as the CWU president and the stevedores were about to disperse from the labor office on Albert Street, the minister, Dr. Carla Barnett, requested to speak with him, no doubt to convince him to return to the meeting. The men went back upstairs, and half hour later, the minister exited with the good news that the two sides were at the very least talking again and that the initial tensions from the afternoon had cooled off. It was just a little bit of a misunderstanding at the start of the meeting and I'm sure they'll both want to give you their own views on, um, on what happened. Sometimes it is not what you say, it is how you say it. And I think there was a little bit of a difficulty in the way um, things were being um, put across the table. Um, and it required a little bit of a cooling off. That simple sticking point could have caused today's negotiations or, or discussions to grind to a complete halt. It could have, yes, I agree. And um, again, like I said, I did not expect that the 21 days would have been extended. Obviously, I, I did not ex expect that. But again, with the explanation I got, I am prepared to continue to, to, to discuss it. I thought that once we had arrived at at that compromise of saying they will, we, we, will, we will exchange concrete proposals for the hours of work, I thought the 21 days came up. So that left the two sides to discuss the matters planned for the afternoon. And today's meeting was rather brief when compared to yesterday's sessions. We have presented them a verbal description of our counter proposal on the matter of hours of work. Uh, it was sent to them during the lunchtime today. So they have asked for more time to look at it. So we are scheduled to meet on Tuesday morning about what they feel about our counter proposal. What we have said to them that is very important for us when it comes to the hours of work, for us to get from them a sense of whether or not the direction that we are going with our counter proposal is a direction they are okay with. Because accompanying that verbal description of our counter proposal is the work that has to be done by our accountant. That's fleshing it out with numbers, and that's going to take some time. And we express to them the reason why it takes time is not because we are trying to be disrespectful to the process, but if we make a wrong move, our members are the ones that will carry the burden of that. We can't make a single mistake with those numbers, and our accountant has expressed that. We also believe, ultimately, that we still seek that intervention from the Minister of Labour to create an exception 
for what Steve Rodos do. We believe it's a unique profession and we believe the nature of it requires that kind of attention from the law. So that is still a part of our counter proposal. But I've looked at it briefly and I, I believe some of it could be considered, but some of it I'm sure may not be able, we may not be able to consider. But I'm not, I'm not saying that now. We, we, he agreed that, yeah, I got it at this time and I need some time to look at it. So we will meet again um, next week. I think it was Tuesday morning. In the meantime, there will be no strike, at least for the next 10 days. That postponement of industrial action comes by way of the minister's intervention, exercising the powers given to her under the law. We were in fact preparing to extend the 21 days by 10 days um, so that we could proceed with the establishment of the tribunal that's provided for under the law so that if it came to that, we would be able to activate that very quickly. Today we wrote both the um, Port of Belize and the Christian Workers Union formally telling them that we were extending the 21 days by a further 10 days so that we could proceed to establish the tribunal required under the law. And we also um, are sending off letters as we speak to the Chamber of Commerce and to the National Trade Union Congress to identify um, representatives who can uh, become a part of the tribunal that is to be set up under the law. She has the power to extend our 21 days and so she has extended that uh, 10 more days and uh, our, our legal advisor has told us that she has the power to do so. So, while the two sides try to resolve the hours of work impasse, there is foreshadowing of another major point of contention that's brewing between them. We brought up a matter that is very important to us. And we uh, told the PBL negotiating team, since yesterday they, they indicated that the gang composition was a matter that they consider pending. Now, you must understand for us that was very uncomfortable because our gangs have already been reduced by the intermediate agreement. So we don't view that as something that is pending. That's a matter where our Steve Rodos have already sacrificed a man. Uh, apparently, uh, they are of the opinion that we are to look at reducing our gangs even further. And uh, we have told them that if there is anything that is made of titanium, it is that position. That even though uh, we are here to negotiate, when it comes to the gang size, we will not move. And so we have informed them that we will write a letter to the minister to indicate that we have another problem. We are not declaring an impasse on it, but we are saying based on their response that they are firm on their position, and we have told them that our position is made of titanium, then we want the minister to, to get that on her radar. There was an agreement signed um, June of 2017 where there were four points that were agreed to. And that's when the CBDOs got their increase in their, in their pension from 3% of regular salary to 4% of production bonus, which actually multiplies the, the pension tenfold. So what I'm trying to explain to the union is that that one particular item that, that we would have this cost of further deduction came as a result of, an, of, of, of a complete joint agreement. It, 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 it was negotiating, you get this, I get this, and that type of thing. And this, would have, this is something that would, have been a, would, would, would be implemented in 2020. But at the point I make again is that right now we're at 2018, so it seems close. But we actually did that in June of 2017. So we were actually looking at almost three years to look at this thing. So I think that because it's a part of a original give and take negotiation, I think that it should remain on the table. And, but of course I do appreciate the fact that Mr. Hyde was not around then, so he may not fully understand the, the, the give and take that we did then. I mean we moved from 3% to 3% to to three on production, then 4 on production, and there, there, there was quite, 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 quite a bit there. Reporting for 7 News, Daniel Ortiz. As to the issue of back pay that the port owes the stevedores, both the port CEO and the CWU president tell us that there is an agreement that the port will pay them in two installments on November 15th and two weeks later at the end of the month. Then two sides meet again on next week, Tuesday morning. Uh, there's an interesting situation developing at Belize's western border tonight. A caravan of five buses 
with Central Americans pulled up at the border this afternoon into evening. We're told the persons seen sitting outside the Benke Free Zone are requesting entry into Belize as a church group that visits regularly. But because of the concerns right now about caravans of asylum seekers heading out of Honduras, the Immigration Department has not allowed them to enter. Central Americans do not require a visa to visit Belize, but these buses have caught the attention of Bemopan because Honduran caravans of asylum seekers have caused a political uproar in the U.S. Belize doesn't want to send the signal that asylum seekers heading north are welcome. 7 News has confirmed that the Immigration Department has refused them entry at this time. We'll keep monitoring the situation, but at this time the buses remain on the Guatemalan side. Armed robbers struck again at CP gas station last night. It happened around 7. Two gunmen held up the owner's son inside the station and rode off with the stolen cash. Police have more. Before 7, there was a robbery at a CP gas located on the Philip Golson Highway. The owner of the establishment reported that he was inside of the establishment conducting his daily business. When two male persons entered the building, one of them had a hoodie, and he proceeded inside of the shop, looking at the stall to see, or wanting to buy something from inside, while the other one followed him. When the other one arrived near the counter, he pulled out a firearm from his pocket and pointed at the owner's head and demanded for him to hand over the cash. The other male persons, the other male person, he went over to the counter and took a bag containing an undisclosed amount of cash that was under the counter. Thereafter, the two male persons made good their escape on bicycle on Captain Ely Street. As we have reported in July, one of the owners fought off two robbers and scared them off, taking a beating in the process. Police will also review the surveillance footage from the station in this latest case. For the last few weeks, you've been hearing all about the differences between the BNTU and the Ministry of Education. They're arguing over which teachers qualify for hardship allowances. That's a monthly stipend of $1 to $200 for teachers who have to slug through rough terrain or traverse long distances to get to work. The ministry-led Joint Education Staff Relations Council has been doing a review of those hardship allowances with stakeholders, including the BNTU, since April. They're reassessing which schools qualify for hardship in 2018 since the last hardship list was generated in the year 2000. The ministry moved to wrap up the process in September and the BNTU reacted angrily. The BNTU says that some schools, which were cut from the list or had their allowances reduced, have been unfairly disenfranchised. During the heated back and forth, the ministry reopened the discussion on the hardship list. They offered both the managing authorities of schools and the BNTU the opportunity to submit additional recommendations, full implementation of the revised list by the end of this month. That meeting was to happen yesterday at a meeting of the Joint Education Staff Relations Council. Senior Ministry personnel were there to further review the recategorization of hardship schools and time off for payday, but the BNTU did not make any presentations, which is just what Elena Smith told us they would do last Friday. She explained why. Imagine, if you look, look at this list, imagine us justifying all of these things via an email or, or, or a letter. You can't, you won't do justice in a written form. So it's best that we sit, both sides, both parties sit, we discuss the matter and see, you know, okay, I can understand your point. All right, I can meet you halfway here, you meet me halfway there, and we agree on this, and we try to, to do those things. A release from the ministry says as much, noting, quote, the BNTU representative indicated that they were not in a position to offer any specific considerations. Instead, the union has asked that a meeting of its branch level leaders and officials of the ministry be held so that the specific recommendations can be adequately ventilated, end quote. A ministry spokesperson says they have agreed to that request, but no time or venue has been announced. And in the meantime, the implementation of the new hardship list is postponed. 
The ministry's statement says, quote, the matter of finalizing the recategorization of schools and time off for payday continues to be a work in progress. In the meantime, previous arrangements for hardship allowances and time off for payday remain in effect, end quote. And now the irony in all this is that as the old saying goes, while the grass, they grow, the has the starve. In this case, that would be a reference to those two teachers at Grime Creek Government School. We've shown you the arduous seven-mile hike they have to take to get to work, and for all that, they do not currently get a hardship allowance. They will only get it when the new list comes into effect, which right now looks like no time soon. We asked President Smith about that. Now, the irony in all this is, according to the Deputy Chief, Cecilia Ramirez Smith, Graham Creek mm -hmm. won't get its hardship until the new list goes in because Graham Creek was not in the 2000 hardship list. Correct. So then. Because they were not existent then. Fair enough. So then, is, is this an injustice specifically to Graham Creek? Because until the new list goes into effect, there's no hardship allowance of Graham Creek. Jews, Valley of Peace, the assemblies and um, um, management, that school was on the list before. There has been no revision to that list since that list was put forward. Yet, Valley of Peace was taken off the list. And those teachers stopped getting hardship allowance for about three years, so years now. Nobody can explain to those teachers who took them off and why. The Catholic school is in the same vicinity, and they continue to get their hardship allowance. So it's not just a matter of Graham Creek getting on the list now. It's a matter of schools who were there before, where we have no reason why they were taken off, and now being placed back, and they're being referred to as new. They're not new, they were there before. You owe them three years. So while these new schools will have to wait a bit longer to get their hardship allowances, it is best that we address this matter properly and we have all those teachers who are supposed to be getting what they should be getting, that they get their fair share based on what they have to go through, as opposed to rushing a list and the teachers are cheated of what they need to be getting. So we've spoken with our teachers at Graham Creek and they fully understand and they support what we are doing. And while they'll have to wait for the hardship, Smith says that since our story aired, they have gotten a number of donations for the teachers at Graham Creek. And we take a break now, but when we come back, an arsonist set a house on fire and you'll hear from the woman who escaped it. Don't go away. This weather report was brought to you by RFNG Insurance. It pays to get it right. RFNG Insurance is a member of the Rogue Group of Companies. Good evening, Belize. This evening's weather report and forecast was prepared by the National Meteorological Service and produced by Bell Caribe Communication Services. I am Frank Tench. Our weather was a blend of sunny and cloudy skies today. The pressure gradient over the Western Caribbean has been supporting a gusty easterly flow for Belize and coastal waters. A tropical wave near the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula and Belize will bring another bout of showers and thunderstorms for central and coastal Belize tonight and into Friday. Another tropical wave was approaching the central Caribbean. Elsewhere, tropical cyclone formation is not expected through Saturday. Satellite imagery from early today resolved much deep convection over the Western Caribbean and near the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula and northern Belize. 
a mixture of layered clouds and showers appeared over the western and central Caribbean. Considerable multi-layered clouds with showers south of Hispaniola were associated with a tropical wave. For the regional forecast, most cities in Central America will encounter a few showers or thunderstorms. Across the Caribbean, Kingston, Jamaica and Havana, Cuba will share the pleasant weather tomorrow. Here at home, we can look forward to mostly cloudy skies tonight. A few showers and isolated thunderstorms will occur over southern and some coastal areas. Low temperatures at dawn for coastal areas will be near 79 degrees Fahrenheit. Inland, the minimum will be near 73. Over the hills, the minimum will drop to near 70 degrees. For tomorrow, skies will be sunny with cloudy periods. A few showers will occur along coastal areas in the morning before decreasing later. The high temperatures will range from 88 degrees Fahrenheit along the coast to 93 degrees inland. Over the hills, the maximum will reach near 75 degrees. Winds over the seas and coast will blow from the east at 10 to 20 knots. The sea state will be choppy to moderate. Now for an in-depth look at the marine and astronomical conditions. The outlook through to Saturday will favor generally cloudy skies with a few showers and isolated thunderstorms mainly over central and coastal areas. Sunday's weather will be generally pleasant. La perspectiva para el sábado favorecerá cielos enormemente nublados con algunas lluvias y tormentas aisladas principalmente en las zonas centrales y costeras. El clima de domingo será generalmente agradable. Today's hurricane tip, after tropical cyclones and earthquakes, floods represent the greatest natural disaster in terms of lives lost. Have a pleasant evening, then join us again tomorrow for another version of the weather forecast. I am Frank Tench. This weather report was brought to you by RFNG Insurance. It pays to get it right. RFNG Insurance is a member of the Rowe Group of Companies. Welcome to RFNG Insurance's educational series. Our aim is for you to understand insurance and how it works. Today, we will be discussing what you should do in the event of an accident. No matter how careful a driver you are, traffic accidents happen. Whether it's a minor fender bender or a major collision, most of us will deal with a traffic accident at some point in our lives. Here are a few things that you should do in the event an accident occurs. One, immediately call an ambulance if anyone is hurt. Two, report the motor vehicle accident to the police. Three, take photos at the scene of the accident and of the vehicles involved. Four, note the other driver's name, driver's license number, telephone number, as well as insurance information. Five, Contact your insurer as soon as possible to report the accident. Six, be sure not to accept liability or any monetary settlements at the scene of the accident. If you need more information about the claims process, contact our claims department at 223-5734. Thanks for joining us and catch us for our next installment where we will be discussing motor insurance and its importance.
Police haven't established a motive for Kevin Thomas's murder as yet, but fortunately police have the 18-year-old suspected shooter, Shadron Deshaun Dillett, under a police guard at the hospital as he recovers. The teenager was shot by a special constable as he tried to flee the scene. Police say he is expected to be charged with murder when he is released. Thomas was shot close to home on Monday night as he was buying at a neighborhood store near the Yabra Bridge. We have an update reference the shooting of Mr. Kevin Thomas, which occurred on Monday night. Unfortunately, on yesterday's date at about 10.40, he succumbed to his injuries while receiving treatment at the Carl Hughes Memorial Hospital. The person that was suspected to be involved in the shooting, he is still admitted at the hospital. And then until he's released, police will determine whether or not any other charges will be le if any charges will be levied against him. Up to now, we have not established a motive. Unfortunately, the investigators did not have an opportunity to speak to the deceased because of his condition. However, we managed to interview persons on the area where the police has gotten enough information, and I believe that after this person is release some hospital. We just have to follow our procedures and thereafter charges will be levied on him. For viewers, the story of the five-year-old girl raped by her stepfather is heart-wrenching and deeply disturbing. Just imagine what that child is going through. While the stepfather has been charged with rape, the baby has to get help to try and heal from this trauma. Police told us more about this case. The child was brought to Belize City where a medical was conducted and the doctor certified that the child was carnally known. Based on that report that she made on the investigation that the police conducted, a 31 year Salvadoran national was arrested and charged yesterday for the crime of rape of a child. Certainly the investigators know whether or not this stepfather has done similar acts against this child before. No. It's the first time. What's the medical condition of the child at the moment? The child has been released from the hospital. However, based on the investigators and the social worker, the child is going through some trauma, and we understand that it's a very young child, and we have to give her time and the family time also to try to recover from this unfortunate incident. And we cannot be pressuring them at this time. So we have spoken to the family members and the human services and we have assisted them with counseling and that is something that will take a little bit of time before the child fully recovers. As we have reported, the child's mother left her home alone to get food. When she returned, she found her nude husband and her baby crying and bleeding. Today, the stepfather was brought to court in Belize City where Magistrate Emerson Banner explained to him that he will not take a plea because the offense is indictable. He also explained that the magistrate's court cannot offer him bail because of the nature of the offense. He remanded the stepfather into custody until December 10th. He is originally from Salvador and has been living in Belize for five months. Usually when we report on fire as the homes are completely destroyed, the families lose everything and in the worst case scenario, lives are lost. Well, in our next story, a woman was spared from all that when only a small portion of her wooden home was scorched. Today, homeowner Andra Diaz expressed how grateful she was to be alive and sent a message to the arsonist whose lawless act could have killed her. Courtney Weatherburn has the story. This is as far as the damage goes on this Consuelo Street home. The fire torched this portion of the house, leaving blackened holes in the walls like nasty scars. Although it was a minor fire, it was anything but trivial for the homeowner, Andre Diaz, who could have been burnt alive inside. Diaz was asleep when she was awakened by commotion outside. She had no idea that an arsonist doused her home in kerosene and lit it. When I hear everybody just sort of like, Mama is in there, Cause they think like the house just catching fire and I, I wasn't in it. So when I run out, I run straight to my grandma and I asked her when they tell me fire, I run in back. I see the fire, the start kind of when I in exit my house. 
I don't see smoke and real darkness, but I didn't see the fire. When I come back, I see the fire. I help myself out it from the inside while my father and the fire engine men was at the back, bucket and thing, try out it there. And like, you know, only that I could say. I never smell the kerosene. I don't smell, yeah, while I was asleep, nothing. The fire could direct that my head then when I started. I may have burned up my whole head, even if my body could have made a live while he. 65% my head gone, you know. Police combed the area and found the bottle of kerosene the culprits left behind. At the scene likewise, police were able to locate a transparent container containing a suspected accelerant that we suspect was used to light up the building. But for someone who was almost killed inside her home, she was very forgiving basking in the joy of being alive. I'm not holding no grudge. I'm not holding no hatred, no jealousy, no envy. No, all my tears that I drop, that for the blessing, I drop upon all those who think for me do that to my house. I just have to thank the good Lord, and I like to say this is a blessing. I don't call this luck. I know not believe in a luck. I know I have a blessed child. And you're very happy to be alive right now? Very, very happy. Very happy. I'm not only happy for my life, happy for my house. I name have a good three anniversary, five anniversary years in this year. Reporting for 7 News, I'm Courtney Weatherburn. Diaz built her home two years ago. She says she has no idea who would want to burn her house down or harm her. Again, it is amazing that her wooden home that was doused in kerosene was not completely destroyed. Police have a person from the neighborhood detained. Today, the Sacred Heart Primary School teachers met with the engineer regarding their severe sewerage problem. The engineer thoroughly inspected the entire system and the bathrooms. When we called for an update this evening, the principal told us that they are still in discussions with the engineer and will give us an update tomorrow. Last week, Wednesday, you saw the anti-ICJ Belize Peace Movement meeting in Balmopan with a cross-section of supporters and interested parties, including the PUP Southern Caucus. But while we waited until the meeting finished, we don't know what they discussed. Today, a one-week later release from the Peace Movement says, quote, of particular concern was the GOB handling of the ICJ education campaign and the apparent collaboration of the opposition party on this matter, end quote. The meeting agreed to organize and establish offices in strategic locations, internationalize the No to ICJ campaign, and a call for greater participation of civil society, including the unions and business community, in the awareness campaign. The group says further meetings are scheduled and activities will step up as the date for the referendum on the ICJ draws near. Jaime Enrique Rosado, a tour guide from Travelers Palm Street in Key Cocker, is facing several fisheries offenses after the fisheries department busted him with undersized lobsters. The fisheries department says that on May 22nd of 2018, fisheries officers went to Key Cocker and they found Rosado with 33 lobsters. He didn't have a fishing license and so the officers arrested and charged him with possession of lobsters during a closed season possession of 24 undersized lobsters, possession of two lobsters with soft shell and engaging in commercial fishing whilst not being the holder of a valid fisherman's license. He was arraigned today before Magistrate Emerson Banner and he pleaded not guilty to all offenses. He was released on bail of $1,500 and he must return to court on November 20th. When we come back, we'll talk to the Belize Free Zone Minister about what she plans to do about the news that Chetamal will become a free zone. Don't go away.
Last night, we told you about the POP's dire take on the news that Chetamal will become a sort of free zone under new president, Manuel Obrador Lopez. The POP says it's a death knell for the zone and could result in the loss of hundreds of jobs. Worst of all, they say government is doing nothing about it. Well, Minister of State in the Ministry of Economic Development, Petroleum Investment, Trade and Commerce, Tracy Tegapanton, says it is a case of premature panic. She gave us her take via telephone today. It's not all doom and gloom, as, of course, the opposition would like to suggest, uh, because there's very little that we know about this proposal that has been floating around by the, the president-elect. What we do know is that there would be a reduction in GSD from 16% to 8%, and we also know um, that Fuel, tax, fuel, fuel prices should be aligned with prices in the U.S. Those are the only two incentives that have been specifically discussed or in public by the Mexican authorities. It has not discussed any exemptions in business taxes. Um, as you know, businesses in the free zone or investors in the free zone don't pay any business tax for the first 10 years of their operation, so that is an incentive. It has not mentioned any duty-free exemptions uh, for businesses operating in what is being floated as a duty-free area in, in Chetamal. So I think before we go into panic mode, I, we need to learn more about the proposal, and we also have to be assured that government is doing its part since March of this year in looking at how we increase the economic growth um, and prosperity of our northern districts in Belize. The opposition should know that there is a new shrimp farm that has been recently established in Libertad um, in Corozal that's doing extremely well for the export sector. Um, it's the first time we have a shrimp farming operation in Corozal. And if this goes well, we do expand, expect to have an expansion of shrimp farming in, in, in the northern part of Belize. And as you know, Jews, we have been also discussing um, putting in place the regulatory framework for industrial hemp. Um, and let's not forget the all-important um, tourism sector and what opportunities lie in tourism for, for Northern Belize. Tega Panton also adds that BPO services are another projected area of employment expansion in the north. Police are still trying to piece together what happened to Felina James. She is a 36-year-old mother of two who went missing on Thursday after leaving her sons with a friend. As we told you last night, city council workers who were cutting the grass near the lands department in Belmopan came across a stack of ID cards, credit and bank cards belonging to James. And police also got a tip that her Kia Sorrento was seen between Sartineja and Shunosh villages on Friday night. But still there are no clear answers in this case. Police told us what they know so far. On yesterday's date, Belmopan police were called to Queen Elizabeth II Street that is near the lands department by the U.S. Embassy, where police were handed over three documents pertaining or belonging to the missing person. One was a social security, a driver license, and a boat captain license. The woman that she left her kids with, did she give a reason why she was leaving her kids with them? Was she going to work? What was the... Yes, the babysitter had mentioned that the kids were dropped there and that she was going back to Sardineja where she came from to go and get the rest of her items, belongings, so that he can bring it to Belize City. Sir, so what is her address? She was living in Sardineja village for two months. Okay. And then she moved to Belize City? She had a misunderstanding with a person where she was staying and she left from Sardineja and came to Belize City. Recently? That was just Wednesday night. Um, that person had been interviewed that she was living with, she had a dispute with? The husband is being interviewed. 
and the boyfriend that she has right now is also being interviewed. And we have a major update on this case of missing person Felina James. That's just in. Our information is that her decomposed body was found about 20 minutes ago on the coastal road. The postmortem will be conducted tomorrow morning. And now this comes after the police gave an update today at the press briefing. We'll have more on the story in our newscast for tomorrow. For the past 10 years now, Ernest Billery has been on remand at the Belize Central Prison after he was charged with arson for allegedly burning his sister's house down. Back in January of 2008, Dawn Billery lost $77,000 worth of property in the fire which destroyed her home on Hibiscus Lane in the St. Martin's Deports area. That fire almost claimed the lives of Dawn Billery's two younger children who were a four months old and a six year old at the time. Fortunately, they were saved by their eldest brother, who was 16 years old at the time. But for his bravery, he suffered burns to the forehead and the nose. Residents reported seeing Ernest Billery jumping the fence and running away at the time of the fire. Six days later, Billery was charged with arson, and on September 11th of 2009, a jury declared him unfit to stand trial due to mental illness. A psychiatrist assessed him and determined that he suffers from chronic psychotic disorder and that he cannot assess reality adequately. In all that time, the case has not been brought back up and there has not been any resolution either way on his arson charge. His other sister has been and continues to agitate for his release. And today she came to us to complain that she has been pushed around. Here's what she had to say about her brother as 10 years behind bars. I have been up and down. They try to look for help, and this has been years. And all the way I am getting from everyone that he is not fit because he has a mental problem. What um, happened? I mean, his sister, hers, one of my sister, that her house, he may burn down. You know? So I'm still not sure if he is the one who's doing it. But like I said, he has a mental problem, so I do not know. But I am seeking for help. Anyone out there in the highest, in any government, in a whatever, my brother needs to come out of prison. He's my little brother and I would like to seek help for him. I am trying this for years. I am not a really healthy person myself, but I am trying my, my best for trying to help my brother right now. So I will, I will uh, this is the help where I'm, what, what I'm asking for right now. I up and down in court, I up and down to the court, I up and down upstairs, downstairs, over the next side Supreme Court. They have told me that my brother is not fit. Yesterday we called up, up, the, up to the Kobe. And they say things, they say they don't know why they have him up there. All of them, all of that, all of them is getting from whatever person that he is not fit because he has this mental problem. And that is just the, the, the shibarong. And, and I mean, this thing happened to poor people because they don't have money for, to get a good liar. Right now, one liar, he told me plenty he could get out my brother, but he went $1,500. I cannot come up with that money right now because right now, like I said, it's hard out here, you know? and. When I don't get him out for this 1500 what about when I want my next money for, for the trial? I'm, I don't I think my brother's supposed to him be there for the next trial. He didn't spend 10 years overspend his time for arson. Overspend his time. So, you know, this is what I'm seeking and I'm begging. I say, anyone out there, I have sister, I have brothers. Even them, could I, I, I ask them for a little help, but everybody's balling that they don't have, have the finance. But I am trying for my brother. And I would like the Kobe Foundation, the government, or whosoever who is listening, please try and make my brother come out of prison. This is 10 years now. I mean, hell, this is a sin. He, don't, he, don't, he doesn't have a life. He doesn't have nothing. We spoke with prison CEO Virgilio Murillo, and he told us that he knows about Billery's case. He said that he recently received instructions from the Supreme Court for Billery to get another psychiatric evaluation. He told us that the country only has one psychiatrist, and the last time he was informed, that doctor, who is a Nicaraguan, may be on vacation right now. He said that they will carry out the evaluation as soon as the doctor is available. Two months ago, we told you how the health experts at the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CARFA, 
declared that Zika was no longer a threat to Caribbean nations. Well, today the organization announced that the World Health Organization has removed its Zika virus country classification scheme, which categorized most of the Caribbean territories having active Zika virus transmission. This shift comes on the heels of data released by CARFA, which showed evidence that the Zika virus transmission in the Caribbean has been interrupted for over 12 months now, or that the virus was at undetectable levels. Canada, the UK, Europe and the US all report that no new Zika infections have been detected over the last 12 months in travelers returning from the Caribbean. In a release, Dr. C. James Hospedalis, the executive director of CARFA, explained that the Zika classification was having an adverse impact on the tourism industry of the Caribbean nations. He said, quote, the Caribbean is the most tourism dependent region in the world. It is also one of the most popular honeymoon destinations worldwide and ongoing cancellations due to the classification of Caribbean countries as Category 1 is hurting the industry unnecessarily. Therefore, CARFA felt compelled to provide the evidence and to advocate for the removal of this WHO Zika classification system. There was a Ministers of Tourism Zika meeting today on San Pedro. Tourism minister and officials from Central America gathered to discuss key topics and issues affecting tourism in the region. A new project was also launched to help entrepreneurs advance their small and medium-scale businesses. Here is more from the meeting. The General Assembly meets twice a year. Um, as most people know, Belize is the pro term president of uh, SICA and all of its branches, SITCA, which is meeting in the room behind us. And um, what it has done is brought the tourism representatives from all Central American countries and the Dominican Republic together um, to update on different developments in tourism, security, um, climate change now being added to the list and several other important uh, issues affecting tourism throughout the region. For us, the Central American Tourism Council um, is a very important uh, institution um, to fasten the tourism integration uh, in the Central American region um, and with the Dominican Republic. Um, Nicaragua has been a, a country very committed with the integration system. We have been strongly participating in all the different meetings and events. One of the main results was the launching of Promitur, is a project um, seen for this SMEs, the small medium uh, tourism uh, enterprise in which it would be um, financing, uh, giving them grants, loans for them to develop their infrastructure and with that uh, strengthen the touristic region, uh, the touristic uh, offer in the region. Um, also to have that uh, the strengthening of the ties within our countries but also within the different ministries of tourism. The other session will be in December. And that's our newscast for tonight. Thanks for watching with your news. I'm Indira Craig. Remember that you can see a streaming video of this newscast at 7newsbelize.com. Cortisa BTL, Belize's fastest, most reliable broadband provider. Do join Courtney Weatherburn in here tomorrow, and I'll be back here on Monday. So until then, have a great night.